Welcome, and thank you for joining me as we walk through the Gospel of Matthew. Today we're going to be dealing with two very interesting parables, talking about the kingdom of heaven, and uh, Jesus getting pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, pretty harsh, and in your face with the Sanhedrin in front of all the crowds in the temple. So let's get into the text, see what's going on. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him, they threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. It's interesting, if you recall the lessons we had a couple uh, weeks ago, uh, John the Baptist, they, they want to know uh, where Jesus' authority comes from, and he says, well, tell me where John's baptism comes from. And they had the same dilemma in their discussion. They were like, if we, if we say it came from heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe in him. And if we say it didn't come from heaven, uh, the people might stone us to death because they think he's a prophet. So they, they're in the same quandary with Jesus that they were with John the Baptist. And of course, that was Jesus' point. He said, he asked them the question about John's baptism because he was telling them, my authority comes from the same place as John the Baptist did. And so he's telling this parable, and once again, they're stuck. They know he's talking about them. They know he's, he's implying that uh, they, they're going to be thrown out of the kingdom. And here they are, the religious leaders, the, the so-called symbols and representation of the people of God. And yet Jesus is telling them, uh, you guys aren't going to make it because of the way you think Judaism should be versus what it actually ought to be. We need to realize this is a, almost a blow-by-blow blow the last week of Jesus' life. He's in the temple during Passover, thousands of people in Jerusalem, and he's talking to the Sanhedrin, but he's doing it in front of all of those people who have come for the Passover. And uh, they're getting a little more than they paid for in that they're seeing this big sort of face-off between the Sanhedrin and this young popular rabbi named Jesus of Nazareth. And he's getting less and less subtle. He's, he's pretty much letting them know how God feels about the current religious leaders that are supposed to be representing God. And, uh, you know, when, when, when it says religious leaders, what it's really saying is those who should know better. Uh, that's the, when, when, when these parables and these stories in the gospel talk about the religious leaders, it, it's sort of drawing a, a, an arrow towards they ought to know better, and they don't. 
Well, by the end of the parable, the religious leaders have figured out that Jesus is specifically referring to them. These parables have a common theme, and they keep getting at the fact that people who should know better don't, or, or know better, but aren't acting it out, aren't living it, and uh, they're going to be thrown out by the owner of the vineyard. And uh, they don't like it, but again, the crowds are loving hearing Jesus' parables and talking about the kingdom. And then the Sanhedrin's not real popular with the crowd, so they're having to be very careful about how they handle it. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to kill him. By the end of this week, they're going to. But they're not going to do it in front of the crowds that Jesus is speaking to. Now, what do we need to know about this whole thing? What's the point, I guess we should say, is that, uh, you know, God is the owner, and when I say the owner, I mean he created everything. He owns everything. Uh, he's he, It's his world. Um, yeah, I even like the, the etymology of history is it's his story. That, that everything we're doing on this world, in this universe, belongs to God. And that's just a foundational understanding if you have a relationship with God is he's the owner. He owns it. He lets us use it. Uh, even Paul makes a statement in Corinthians. What do you have that you have not been given? And if it's been given to you, why do you boast? He's, he's saying the exact same thing to the Corinthians that Jesus is saying here. God owns everything. And we need to understand that he's letting us use it. But when, when he lets us use it, he has some expectations about how that relationship works. Anytime you have a, any kind of a relationship, there are two-way communication, two-way expectations. If you get hired for a job, the boss is going to pay you money. In exchange for him paying you money, he expects you to do a specific task or a specific job. And if you don't do that, he'll quit paying you. Well, this is the same kind of relationship we have with God. He, he's given us all these wonderful blessings, all of our possessions and even our work. And if we don't appreciate it and if we don't do what he expects us to do with it, he'll take it away and give it to somebody else. There are many parables that make that point. He expects us to use what we have been given to produce good fruit. That's the whole tenet of the vineyard. He, he rents this vineyard out to get a, a profit from it, to get the fruit from it. And when the tenants don't do what they're supposed to do and, in fact, mistreat his representatives, then he's going to throw them out and... Give it to somebody else who will actually do what he's paying them to do, what he's allowing them to do. And here's the thing. The Bible's very clear about this, even in this parable. If we, if we take what he's given us and we don't produce the good fruit that he requires of us, well, there's only one word in Scripture that describes that situation, and that's woe. And if you look that up in Greek... It says untranslatable. And what that means is it's, it's just so bad. Everyone understood this is bad. I, uh, it always makes me think of, I think, Dom DeLuise had the best translation of this word where he said, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really, really bad. That's probably the best translation, translation for woe. It's, it's just so devastating. You don't even want to think about it. You can't even translate it. What are the theological insights here? Well, clearly Jesus is referring to himself when he talks about they kill the son. He says the owner sent his son and said, surely they will respect my son, but they don't. And they kill the son. And uh, in just a few days, that's exactly what's going to happen to Jesus. The religious leaders, those who should know better, are going to end up killing God's son, or at least participating in it. 
And so Jesus wraps up the parable. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Now we see this sort of face-off between the Sanhedrin and Jesus, and we think, yeah, you tell them, Jesus. But boy, we sure need to hear this message. We may be a part of the kingdom of God. We may be part of the people of God, claiming to be Christians, followers of Christ. But are we producing the fruit that God expects of us? He's given us so much. Are we reciprocating and showing our appreciation by producing its fruit? Because Jesus is very clear. If we don't, God will take it away and give it to somebody else. He's, he's being very specific, and, and theologically this is extremely significant, that this is one of those places where Jesus is telling them that, that whatever's going on in the kingdom of God, God's people, the chosen people of Israel, it's going to get redefined. That they're not doing what they were supposed to be doing. And so there's going to be a redefinition of the people of God, of the kingdom of God. And he's clearly referencing allowing the Gentiles in as well as the Jews. And so this is one of those moments where Jesus is literally announcing a whole sort of reframing, reshuffling, redefining who God's people are. And instead of it being children of Abraham, it's going to be children who produce fruit. And we all need to hear that message very clearly. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servant, servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Some translations say were unworthy. Go into the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all of the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. That's a rather chilling final line to that parable. And again, we need to listen carefully. Now, Matthew often talks about how Jesus went about preaching the kingdom of heaven, and these are examples of that. So many of his parables actually start with this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. And he's, he's just making analogies. He's, he's telling stories to get people to understand the principles of the kingdom, to get them to understand what God is looking for in his people. And so we need to pay attention to all of these parables. It's like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. you got to sort of appreciate the whole context there. Um, this isn't the son. This is the king preparing a wedding banquet for his son. Okay, And he wants everyone to come. He wants to celebrate. He's the king. He's the owner of the whole region. He rules. And so if he invites people to a party for his son... They really ought to pay attention and show up. And by not showing up, 
Um, it's bad. God has invited his people to his party for his son. And I know for a lot of you out there, I think the analogy is great because we understand how we would feel. Can you imagine having a birthday party for your son? Maybe when he was in grammar school or junior high, high school even. You plan a big party, you send out all the invitations, you prepare, you get food, you got the cake, and no one comes. I mean, wouldn't that be the ultimate insult, the ultimate offense? Your son would be hurt, but as a parent, you would be angry. I mean, someone it's one thing to disrespect me, but boy, you disrespect one of my children. Yeah, now we got a real problem. And that's what this, this parable is trying to point out. God has invited his people to his party for his son. It's one thing to ignore God. It's another thing to ignore his son. He's even sent his son to get our attention. And if we reject him, well, there's really nowhere else to go from there. When the king invites us to join the party, we'd better show up. We'd better be properly dressed out of respect for our incredible, incredibly gracious host. And we need to get that. This is God's world. This is his story. We're a part of it. He graciously allows us to be a part of it. And it's an incredible privilege. And, and, and if we're going to show up, we need to show up dressed properly, as the parable suggests, and respect the rules of the kingdom. Rejecting the king's invitation is the ultimate insult, the ultimate disrespect, and we know what will happen. He's very clear about that. The kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you if we disrespect the king's invitation to his party. Invited, chosen, elect, these are three words that uh, are all translated from similar words in both Hebrew and Greek. Uh, they all have the same kind of uh, meaning, and uh, they're trying to get something across, not just being chosen, but uh, these words all imply that someone else, God, is initiating the process. Um, that God is, has chosen, has called everyone. And uh, if we want to be his chosen, we need to act like people chosen for a specific job to do it. If God's been gracious enough to bless us with what we have, we need to be gracious enough to reciprocate by doing what he's called us to do. In this parable, the chosen people of Israel are deemed unworthy, uninvited, due to their unresponsiveness to God's invitation. God's not going to force us to do anything. If we want to reject him, he'll let us. I've always said that one of the scariest things about God is if we choose to disobey him, he will let us. And oftentimes we get into big trouble when we do that, and we blame God for it when the fact is we rejected his authority, and now we're in a bad situation. He let us reject his authority. And if we are unresponsive to God... He'll let us go our own way and let us live with those consequences. And uh, so we need to, again, pay careful attention. And, uh, the chosen people of Israel just aren't, aren't they've been chosen, they've been called. They've, he's, he's tried to draw them to him, but they're not responding to him as they should. And therefore, he's going to give the job to someone else, give the blessings to somebody else. And he tells his servants... Those people aren't coming. They won't get to eat my food. They won't sit at my banquet table. And again, there's a lot of theology going on here. And he says to his servants, go gather all the people they could find. And they went out and gathered, and it says both good and bad. And I, I know that sounds like a moral statement, but in this context, it's really saying both Gentiles and Jews. The invitation is being expanded. And it's not going to just be the children of Abraham. It's going to be all peoples who do what God has called them to do, who produce the fruit of the kingdom. 
So what's the call to action? Well, Jesus makes it pretty clear. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. And if you ask me, well, what, you know, what specifically kind of fruit is it? Well, it's the fruit that God's given you to produce. We all have different callings. We all have different jobs to do for the kingdom. We all influence certain groups of people around us. And so there's no way to give you a steps one through three or one through ten of how to produce fruit for the kingdom. It certainly should be guided by the Holy Spirit through the reading of God's word and figuring out what it is God has called you to do, which may be very different from what God has called me to do. But we need to figure that out and we need to start doing it or the kingdom of God will be taken away from us. And so that's why it's so critically important to figure this out. God will choose people who do his will. In other places, he, there's a story about when they say, your mother and brothers have come to see you. And Jesus says, who are my brothers and brothers? Those who do the will of my father. That's how he defines the people of God, those who do God's will. And it doesn't matter what your ethnic background, what your educational background, how wealthy you are. God's people are defined by those who do God's will. Now, if we get into the banquet, we are expected to display our appreciation by conforming to the rules of the kingdom and producing fruit of righteousness. There's that sort of bizarre little insert, it seems, where the guy shows up and he's not wearing the right clothes. And the owner asks him, where are your clothes? And the guy has no answer because everyone knew if you go to a wedding banquet, there are, there's a certain attire demanded of those in the wedding banquet. It'd be like showing up at a wedding today where everyone's in nice dresses and tuxedos and some guy shows up in a tank top, short pants, and flip-flops. It would be so obvious that he is insulting. He is being rude and considerate of those in the wedding. And so this is what he's saying is that if you got in without wedding clothes, you must have snuck in and that you must have not really been planning on participating in the wedding. You're just here for the free food. And that doesn't cut it. And in the parable, he says, tie up hand and feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be gnashing of teeth. Doesn't sound like a good place to be. So we need to, again, accept God's invitation, understanding the expectations he has of us for blessing us so richly in this world. Because many are invited or called, but few are chosen. I pray we will all give this lesson some careful consideration and do everything we can to make sure we are doing what God has called us to do so that we can be among the chosen, those who do the will of God. Thank you for joining me through this lesson.